Progress. The very same company that was in the center of the storm during the Move It transfer exploitation has just recently released another security advisory disclosing a handful of different new vulnerabilities and CVEs. This knowledge base article was released on September 27th and it's discussing the new vulnerabilities present in the WSFTP server ad hoc transfer module and the WSFTP server manager interface. Now, chief among these vulnerabilities is CVE 2023-40044 with a CVSS score of 10. The highest you can get, absolutely critical vulnerability, and that includes in these versions, these are all patched by the way, if you haven't yet, hey, please go update to the latest rendition, but there is a pre-authentication technique to leverage a deserialization vulnerability that offers a threat actor remote code execution. And they can just do whatever they want. Let me know, there are a handful of other vulnerabilities included in this write-up, including another 9.9 .9 CVSS score, another critical here, and a handful of high, 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 medium severities. But I want to focus in on the CVE 2023-40044. Now, this vulnerability was originally discovered and reported by the team over at Asset Node, And I'm sure you're familiar with a couple of those folks. You've probably seen Shubs or Infosec underscore AU over on Twitter or X and hey, their incredible team and all the great research that they do finding new vulnerabilities in this write-up showcases a lot of the behind the scenes as to how this all comes together and it discusses even the proof of concept that we've seen shared on Twitter. I know MCK Sis Argentino also showcased a little bit of the proof of concept within Burp Suite, but ultimately this is literally just a single HTTP request. You send a post method with hey, some special specific AHT default upload parameter and base64 encoded deserialize uh, well will be deserialized payload 4.net and you can run code under the .net execution context. Now this isn't nearly as severe as the move it transfer exploitation vulnerabilities because the researchers were able to get out in front of it, right? They discovered the vulnerability, they were able to responsibly disclose it, have the vendor patch things up and fix things so the security updates are available. There wasn't hey some threat actor or adversary that would exploit this that folks weren't aware of and hey cause potential mass ransomware or at least stealing and exfiltrating data like the clop ransomware gang with that said now that proof of concept scripts and exploit code is out on the internet there can be observed exploitation in the wild and a whole lot of cybersecurity vendors are chatting about this i believe rapid 7 was kind of first to the punch here hey seeing some of the in the wild exploitation and noting the tradecraft noting the post exploitation behavior and chatting about hey the impact of these potential vulnerabilities vulnerabilities. You can dig into and see a lot of the potential processes that will get spawned here. Obviously, this is all under the w3wp.exe or the www worker process, right? IIS, the Microsoft Web Server Utility, and its worker process always running. Underneath it, you'll probably see csc.exe being invoked because it is .NET after all. It's going to end up doing some of the whatever server-side processing that it does to like render and pre-compile a lot of the .NET objects. CVtrez, I believe, does the exact same thing, but I am waiting for you all to help school me and correct me in the comments. Underneath it, hey, the child processes that get spawned, that is where the exploitation can kick in. Some folks are just doing a simple NS lookup to like validate and prove, okay, can I see a DNS request so I know that the exploit is working? Have I like verified code execution? And others are starting to do something a little bit more nefarious. Hey, using invoke web requests from PowerShell to be able to stay, stage and download something like an ntuser.dll that's maybe probably pretty clearly malicious. But it is worth noting that not all of these exploitation attempts could mean a new child process. They could just live entirely in the .NET execution context. We do have a short write-up on this just as well. I know a whole lot of folks and security researchers and analysts were already digging into the vulnerability itself. And with that, we didn't want to have to add to the noise, but Matt Kiley, one of our new principal security researchers did put together a sweet video where he built out a little proof of concept.python script and got to dig into what this really looks like. Uh, super cool video. And I, for one, am stoked that Matt is part of the team. You guys might know him as Husky Hacks Online, but I am super happy we hired that guy. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, crazy long background context. What I want to do is dig into one of the samples that we've seen from the post-exploitation capability and the exploits that we've observed in the wild. Let me note that this is a seriously small number of cases, like less than 10 single digits right now, but we are seeing some PowerShell being invoked underneath the dub3wp process. There are a couple other tidbits where we see cert util kind of being used to download other potential stagers, an executable file, and of course this is the low 
control bin or living off the land binary technique and trick I'm sure you're familiar with. You probably used Cert Util to download stuff during your OSCP exam. But let's go take a look at that PowerShell syntax and see what we can play with here. I'm going to pivot into Remnux, the reverse engineering malware Linux distribution. I'll hit Control Alt T on my keyboard to open up a terminal and I'll full screen it with F11 and I'll make a directory for WSFTP. Now I'll go ahead and use Sublime Text to open up the original payload, just a command that we saw ran. I'll zoom in a bit here and paste this in. Let me toggle on Word Wrap so we can get the full payload here. And there are actually a couple idiosyncrasies. I note that there are comments that I manually added in so that the GitHub gist present online just isn't a full, hey, ready to fire payload, right? So here we go. This is the blob that we get to work with. Obviously, hey, we're kickstarting command prompt cmd.exe. We'll use slash c as the command argument to parse with PowerShell, tack no profile, a hidden window style, non-interactive, and tack c for a command. We could kind of break that out if we really wanted to, but I'm sure that all makes sense to you. Ultimately, this is the PowerShell payload, everything that follows that we want to rip apart. So I'm gonna copy and paste this and I'll actually just bring that into a new page that I'll just call um, cleaning.ps1. How about that? If you hit control shift P, if you haven't already installed package control within Sublime Text, you can start to install package control and you can install a package if you run that again to actually set up PowerShell and that way you'll have PowerShell uh, as syntax highlighting. And I like to do that all because look, if we're gonna be in Linux, especially, we don't want PowerShell to actually execute and run like the native operating system that the malware sample was really written for, right? Even if I were to fire up a terminal, and we'll get to do this in just a moment, if I open up PowerShell Core, PWSH, that is going to have some limitations because it's not a full-blown Windows system, and perhaps maybe some of the hooks and claws of the malware sample won't ever accidentally get detonated. Let's get Word Wrap back on, and let's just actually do something super simple. Let's do a uh, Control H to find and replace, and let's just change every single semicolon to a semicolon new line, a backslash and a little regular expressions there because ultimately if this is all just being ran on one line well that's a little bit harder to read for us as human beings let's just try to break that up into all the different potential lines that might be present there let's go ahead and explore this hey maybe we have a uh, check for the int pointer size that is probably just a gimmick as to whether or not we're running on a 32-bit architecture or a 64-bit architecture if that's the case then we'll use oh sys native windows powershell version 2 whatever one that is just to say, look, I want to use this location for PowerShell and that's 64-bit or 32-bit. Otherwise, we'll just get flat regular PowerShell. We'll stage a new object that we could use to kickstart a process. Uh, maybe a couple arguments for, of course, our PowerShell process that we'll invoke with, again, not interactive, no profile, hidden window, and uh, tax C. So everything inside of this is yet another PowerShell payload that we can unravel. Ultimately, it will hey, set some other flags or variables to say, look, uh, shell execute is false, redirect standard output is true, window cell hidden, blah, blah, blah. Let's keep drilling down and just grab all of this stuff that should come following that tax C argument as that is the new inner payload that we could play with. That is all a string, so I'll go up until that uh, closing single quote and semicolon to denote the end of that statement. Let me right click, copy that, slap that into another little page that we can play with, and let's start to mess this up. Call that, I don't know, stage 2.ps1. So we've already replaced a couple of those semicolon lines, but we do want to be keeping an eye out for those new logical branches, like whenever we have an open curly brace. Here we just check out the version of PowerShell. If it's greater than or equal to 3, then we do all this stuff where, okay, we can start to indent this, maybe clean it up, and we could start to determine what each of these variables actually mean in the context of our running script. Beautifying this is pretty manual, uh, so let me just speed run through this, but basically I want to be looking for those semicolons and new logic to see, hey, how do I uh, break this up? Let's turn word wrap back on because there is more to pull apart here. And this is another semi-manual part because ultimately all of these obfuscated strings, the way that it's using some of the tack F or format strings, like you would hate to note, uh, just in place positions for substitutions or substrings, that is something that we could just sort of let PowerShell unravel for us. And I notice we have duplicate single quotes here, uh, presumably just from, hey, maybe the way that sample was copy and pasted originally. Let's actually just kind of hey, nuke that. Let's say every single single quote we can replace with a single single quote. 
right? Now we have a handful of obfuscated strings that we could just let PowerShell unravel for us because we've sort of diffused the bomb a little bit here. Look, we just know these snippets are things that we're interested in. Let's see if we could let PowerShell just unravel that and then replace it in place for variables that we want to be able to later determine what they are. Now, obviously you could automate this. Uh, in fact, it's probably a better thing to do and I'm sure there are tons of tools that can do it, but I just kind of like to poke and play around uh, and it makes for some good visuals, right? So, hey, let me speed through this. Let me copy and paste. Ooh. Oh, that just needs the uh, beginning uh, parentheses. And that's all right. Now we can see script block logging would be what would uh, fill in for this variable. And we can denote that, hey, maybe that variable name should actually just be script block logging. And we'll do that for basically everything. Pretty dull. Ooh, maybe that's a little bit of a cutesy AMSI bypass or some tricks here. Uh, AMZ, right? AMSI or the anti-malware scan interface. That's one of those little defender modules that's always kind of trying to take a look at managed code, whether it's PowerShell or .NET or JScript or some scripting stuff, right? Uh, and trying to check in, hey, is there anything that's actually going to be nefarious or malicious in that? But if you can actually set some of the properties or methods or functions that it might cause and actually just render them useless, like adding a ret or properly returning true. Like this is innocent, this is benign, when it really is malware. We've talked about AMSI bypasses a lot, but it's always cool to kind of see those in action. Okay, with that, we've cleaned up some of the capability. It looks like we're gonna be tagging uh, script block logging and checking with the PowerShell version to see, hey, do we have any script logging enabled? Or if, even if we don't, right? Look, we wanna be getting all of those potential configurations and settings and then just toggling them off. You can see we're checking the group policy setting just to grab those fields and then force setting them all to zero. So script logging and all the script block invocation is not gonna be monitored and not logged, even with a couple registry tweaks potentially in there. Finally, we have a innermost payload here that we might be able to go explore. Looks like it is just kind of a ampersand to denote, look, this is a new command that will execute and run. A lot not like IEX or invoke expression, and ultimately we'll end up using just a staged base64 encoded gzip stream. We know how to handle these pretty easily, and be, even if it has all this obfuscated concatenation and format strings, we can let PowerShell unravel that all for us. Let's copy and paste that, slap it back over to the side here, and try to get that thing to run. There we go. This is all the base64 that we can replace that thing with. Cool, we know that all of this base64 is going to be decoded and then ultimately gun zipped or like gzip stream deflated and then invoked as PowerShell. So we're likely going to get PowerShell as the result of those operations. Let's try and do that ourselves. Let me paste that into a new file. We can just go ahead and save that as base64, I don't know, payload.b64, right? Pretty boring. Back in a terminal, let's base64 decode that payload, and it should just give us nonsense, right? Because this is all binary data, but let's go ahead and redirect that output into a gzip something, right? I guess really like PowerShell dot gz and then we can go ahead and actually check out hey that powershell dot gz file is in fact gzip compressed data let's go ahead and gun zip that or g unzip and now we'll have powershell and we could take a look at what that thing is but should be pretty simple should be pretty easy it's powershell syntax right let's open that up and see what we have to work with we can go ahead and set the powershell syntax here and look this is probably pretty vanilla usual like uh staging and structure when we're trying to do some reflective stuff you can see hey this is probably the handle cradle to use some of the get proc address or get module handle win32 api calls and then we have something that will stage uh anything else that we might want to run or invoke but ultimately you can see even more base 64 here and that's probably the smoking gun it ultimately uses all the get delegate for function pointer nonsense crap like that to end up invoking this and running it Let's go see what the heck that base64 decoded string is. Get that into a new file. Let's just call that innermost.b64. And now we can try to unravel that. Base64 minus D on the innermost.base64. And ooh, look at this. So I'm entering a whole lot of new lines because there is a lot of spaces that just make up the front half of this, but ultimately it's still just cert util. 
Again, trying to use that living off the land technique to go to this exact same rogue malicious IP address with this endpoint and uh, download a temporary file and then execute it, run it and fire it off. That now begs the question, is that domain or that spooky wookie IP address in port 8080, is that still up? Is it online and active and can we actually get anything out of it? Now this can be sort of uncharted territory, right? Say, hey, we probably want to fire up a VPN or virtual private network in that case, because even if we're sending any packets to that thing, and even if it's not online, look, we don't want to leave any fingerprints on there. And with that, maybe we could fire up Tor, the onion router, or we could use Proton VPN. And actually, I think that's a perfect segue. If I may, I'd love to tell you a little about my favorite VPN, Proton. Email compromise is a constant threat within today's cybersecurity landscape. Your inbox contains personal details about your life, so you don't want this to be in the hands of hackers or email providers that are tracking you. Proton Mail is an easy way to protect your privacy with end-to-end -end encryption so no one, not even Proton, can read your messages. And Proton Mail blocks marketing trackers and malware and protects you from common threats like spam, phishing attacks, and spoofing that can compromise your account. Proton is based in Switzerland, where all of its over 100 million accounts benefit from some of the world's strongest privacy laws. Founded in 2014 by scientists who met at CERN, Proton's mission is to build a better internet where privacy is the default. Alongside the end-to-end -end encrypted email, Proton provides easy-to-use encrypted calendar, file storage, VPN, and a password manager, all built on the principle of your data, your rules. Personally, I use Proton Mail for communication that I want to remain private, and when doing security research, Proton VPN is my preferred choice for browsing privately and anonymously. Get privacy by default with Proton and stop other companies from exploiting your data. You can get started with Proton for free with my link below in the video description, proton.me slash john. Huge thanks to Proton for sponsoring this video. Okay, super simple and easy. Hey, we could just hop over to whatever, I don't know, United States IP address we want, let Proton connect to that, and that should give us enough coverage that we could at least go safely, maybe poke and play at that strange IP address and domain. Let's go ahead and try to just curl that and see, look, is this thing still up? We can use TACV for verbose in just a moment, but let's see if we get anything at all. No. Okay, uh, attack VVV, hey, make that verbose. Look, sending off some of our regular user agents, um, nothing, doesn't respond. How about just port regular 80, how about that? Nope, not at all. I will note that even in the other cert util commands that we saw running across other hosts, it has been this IP address. And I've seen that across many of other folks, and we could go slap this into census or Shodan and go see, hey, what else are folks tracking on that? Just for exploratory sake, let's go slap that into census and see if it can track anything down. Oh yeah, okay. As of like today, the time of recording, at least October 2nd, uh, around 4.42 UTC, it was hanging out with just an Ubuntu server hosting over presumably it's speedy vps uk it had ssh open port 22 maybe that was just so the attacker could continue to work with it but it didn't see any port 8080 it seems like how about the history was there anything anything else present these are older days september 25th 24th uh maybe there was a dns name on it but Okay, 80 and 443 were changed down. I'm assuming that's some cloud, hey, just spun up infrastructure and that IP address probably varied and just got to different hosts here and there, but there's not a whole lot more and this is down at the moment. So I don't think there's any really any runway with that, unfortunately. And that does differ from the payload that Rapid7 was seeing, where it would try to reach Bcrypt. Interesting on port 3389. We did see some post-exploitation activity actually staging RDP and like a uh, little SOX proxy, I think under a service host executable, like a rogue, hey, uh, rename service host.exe under the C backslash Windows directory. Not where it usually is. But anyway, we haven't seen that ntuser.dll yet. And I'm super curious. If anyone has a copy of that, look, I'd love to know. But every single cert util download stager that we have seen has been that 103.163.187.12 uh, location. And 8080, I'm sure, is just going to be some like weird oddball open directory or opener staging and hosting whatever nonsense that it just slaps into a temporary file. 
Uh, these have all seemingly been random names. And even what we saw, like inside of our Remnux output, yeah, like this command still going to 8080 just has a random endpoint. I wonder if it just kind of randomly generates whatever. Still going to be the payload, still going to be the stager. I had tweeted about that earlier today, uh, the small attempts that we've seen for exploitation of CVE 2023-40044. Just the same cert util stagers and PowerShell that we saw, the blob that we just cut through. And on one of those hosts, they were setting up persistence by just stupid simple that 3389 port for RDP on the local firewall and the malicious service host.exe. Virus totaling for that has been pretty wild. There's that hash if it's interesting to anyone, but look, everyone is already screaming about this. Look, a pretty probably well known, 54 to like 60, however many engines detecting that as malicious. We could dig into the details, we could do some of that analysis, but I'm pretty sure, look, it's just bad stuff. Hey, with that, I don't wanna beat you over the head with any more code or nonsense or rambling, so we'll probably wrap up the video there, but but if you are, hey, sticking around to the end, I would love to let you know something else kind of cool that I'm doing throughout this month. It's Cybersecurity Awareness Month after all, October and all that crap. If folks weren't tracking, I am hosting a Capture the Flag with Huntress. Uh, we're going to be releasing a new challenge every single day, and it is hyper-focused on a lot of this, hey, malware analysis or cyber threat intelligence or digital forensics and incident response. We're starting off small. Only the couple challenges that were released today were small, simple things, but it will kind of gradually release more and more and more and more, uh, especially especially in all those categories that we're having some fun with. And you might see exactly a sample just like this for some of the WSFTP stuff, staying real, staying pertinent, staying current to today's trends and threats. Uh, I hope there's some good stuff in there with some warm-ups, make it accessible to everyone, and some malware samples, defer, DFIR, Blue Team stuff, and a ton of fun. So go check that out. Uh, URL is huntress.ctf.games, uh, Discord server, and a lot of cool prizes and good stuff. So please, 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 I'd love to see you on the scoreboard, and we're having fun with that for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And hey, check out Proton with the link below. Seriously, if you're doing a whole lot of that security research or just looking out on the open internet, you should totally be using a VPN. And Proton has so much other incredible stuff for your privacy, anonymity, and there's just great resources down below. Super appreciate them supporting the channel and continuing to let us do what we do. Check them out, link below. Thanks for watching, everyone. See you in the next video.